Kit, welcome to Waterstones. Thank you very much. Uh, Common People is an anthology of working class writers. And I guess the first thing to do, because class is such a weird, slippery topic or theme or idea, should we start by talking about what does working class mean, uh, particularly, I suppose, in 2019? Um, it's extremely difficult to uh, quantify or isolate. And I've had more questions over the past six months <laughs> about do I qualify yeah. for working class? You know, oh, my mum did this, but my dad did that. Or we started here and we ended there. And people don't, you know, I leave it up to people to, de to decide for themselves. I would never be someone that says, oh, well, you definitely aren't. Mm. Um, myself, if, if anyone looked at my lifestyle, they would say I was not working class. But I was born into an extremely working class family, if not underclass family. Mm. And... Um, I would say, in fact, I think Chris McCrudden in the book says once upon a time, working class people used to make things. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen anymore. Although not only make things, because if you think about miners, they yeah. extracted things. So they worked with their hands, I think. Now, working class people sell things or serve you. Um, but even that isn't a complete makeup of the working classes. And of course, it contains within working class people or the phrase working class are people that haven't worked. Mm -hmm. Generations of families sometimes that don't work. You know, unemployment has been a facet of family life. I would still say they're working class even though they don't work. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, very wide, loose, furry, weird expression <laughs> these days. So in that case, I suppose, what was the the catalyst or the sort of the spark that made you want to put this collection together? Well, I wanted to do something that was going to um, showcase working class writing as well as showcase existing working class writers, um, perhaps that people didn't know about. And basically we stole the idea from Nikesh Shuklas, uh, The Good Immigrant. You know, if it works, just copy it, yeah. is my view. So using that model of having lots of different stories from lots of different people all together in one anthology is what we decided to do in the end. And what you've, as you say, you've got some established writers uh, like Mallory Blackman and Jill yes. Dawson, Kathy Renson Brink, yourself, and then you have uh, some brand new writers yes. that we won't have heard of. How did you go about finding them? And I suppose more difficult, how did you decide which ones to include? Yeah. You know, fortunately, I had nothing to do with that. So. Um, <laughs> The writer development agencies, there are six of them that cover um, six geographical areas of the UK. Um, we contacted those and said, could you, with your existing networks, put out a call and say, we have got this opportunity. Would you like to apply to be one of the working class writers? They were inundated mm. with people um, who wanted to be in an anthology and they narrowed it down to a very, very short, short list that I chose from. It was fabulous, I mean, you know, I, a lot of hard work that I didn't do. Um, and they came up with just outstanding writing from each, because I wanted to make sure it covered every geographical area. Mm. Sometimes if you put a, uh, have a competition, for whatever reason, it doesn't cover the margins of the UK. And I really wanted to make sure that this was countrywide as opposed to being London-centric, which so much of publishing is. Well, you, yeah, I mean, you lead on to a good point there, which is that, that publishing itself is, is London-centric, it's very white and middle-class, yes. and, of course, a lot of publishing tends to reflect that. Yeah. So part of the purpose of this book, presumably, is, is, to, is to counter that, yes. to hopefully find some new writers to be published by those sort of established publishing houses. Absolutely. I mean, it's very important to me that not only did it cover the breadth uh, of the UK and the different diverse communities in it, within it, but also that it showcased the different types of working class lives that there are. So you have, um, there are stories in there of a girl that was brought up in a brothel. Uh, there's a story there of um, a guy who is the child of two parents who took heroin. The other end of the scale is the, in inverted commas, respectable working class families. And the, the book showcases all those different types of lives, you know, that Working class lives does not equate with poverty and mm. hardship. It's, a di it's just a different way of living your life. It's got different um, expectations. It's got different, a different ethos about life. It has, and it, you know, very much it's a different understanding of what it is of class in this country. Well, one thing, there's a very varied collection, obviously, of stories, but I noticed a sort of a common theme often was people's pride in their 
working class roots or within their community or yes. their family, the strength of those bonds, that seems yes. to be something. In there. Completely. I mean, overwhelmingly, what I didn't want this to turn into was the four Yorkshiremen in Monty Python, you know, where, <laughs> you know, we're all talking about, oh, yeah, but it was worse for me, yeah, yeah. you know, and we didn't have that. Oh, yeah, but we didn't have that. But I really wanted the book to be a celebration of what it is to be working class, not an apology or the four Yorkshiremen. Look at the humour, look at the solidarity look at the resilience, look how we stuck up for each other, look how we covered for each other. And very much no shame, you know. The, the, the people that have written those stories have been extremely brave. Mm -hmm. They've put out there some difficult information, um, but they're not ashamed of it. They've said, this is where I started, this is where I am now. I may have exactly the, the same amount materially, but I am the person I am because of my upbringing, because of that start in life. There's obviously a huge benefit for anybody who is from the working classes to, to read a book like this, to see their stories being told or their communities represented. And of course, there is a benefit to the middle class or upper class readers to, to read these stories and realise that fiction or non-fiction can be more than just what they're used to reading. Who, who is the book really for and who do you think will benefit most from it? Such a good question. Um, the book is... I would say for us, for working class people, but not entirely. It's also, and, and I do remember having a, a similar conversation with um, Unbound when we were working out who the audience is for the book. It's also for people to say, oh. In fact, I'll, I'll give you an example. When I first announced the book on Twitter, I had some guy, I won't swear, contact me and say, uh, if they were any good, they'd be published already. And this is an answer to that. They are good the unpublished writers, and they're not published. And a lot of that is to do with the structural inequality in publishing, not to do with a lack of talent, not to do with a lack of commitment, not to do with any kind of lack other than opportunity and access to the industry. So it's very much an answer to the people that think the cream rises to the top always, because the cream doesn't rise to the top always. Sometimes there's loads of things in the way of you rising to the top, and sometimes the cream's at the bottom. I think it's a very good place for us to finish, Kit. It's great to see these writers in print, I think, not only for them and their careers, but also for any other working class writers reading this book and realising that they could do it too because they've seen it here yes. in this book. Yeah. So thank you very much. Great, thank you.